praise the Lord. Well, you might get out your phone if you've got the Bible app on your phone because I'm going to be using my phone instead of bringing lots of uh, Bibles up here. This this is really a small podium, and um, I'm going to use the Amplified in the message. For some reason, on my phone, I don't have the passion anymore. And and if you do have Amplified Bible, uh, mine just says Amplified Bible, so I don't know if it's classic or just regular Amplified. So we're just going to go with the flow. Is that okay if we just use that? But we're talking about the judgment seat of Christ, and I want to get to your handout. And if you look at your handout, it's a different handout than you would have received before. And that is because I added some things to it. Not that you tossed the other one, but because there was a little bit different information. And you can download the handout, those of you online. But I really want to amplify some of these scriptures and prayerfully I'll get through these 10 things that you're going to be held accountable for because um, as we know from pre previous message the judgment seat is defined as an official place where judgments and rewards are rendered to those who stand before an official judge and I really want you to get that word picture in your mind of you standing before this big desk a judge's desk and you standing face to face with Jesus and it, it's it's going to be uh, I was thinking about this it could be maybe a little bit intimidating especially for those of us who didn't know what I've been teaching now we know now we know at least what we're going to be accountable for and so we, we know to prepare, and that's what I've been teaching us, that this is for church age Christians. As soon as the rapture, we don't know exactly when that's going to be, but we know soon and very soon we're going to see Jesus face to face. And I don't know about you, but I'm excited about that. But I'm more excited about uh, and passionate about getting kids saved. And because of uh, maybe maybe I'm more passionate than ever about children because of the fact that the attack is so strong on children and teens in this in this era in this time and so I just want to encourage you get your kids in church uh, read your Bible with them I mean talk to them get in their head these are the times that that they need to be strong in the Lord just like you are you can be strong in the Lord in the power of your might but and power of his might but if your grandkids aren't or your kids aren't then we got a problem here so I'm just passionate about this because we've got to get to this generation we've got to get to the these kids because we know just like the Word of God says um, Jesus is going to do an ex inspection of our records a thorough ex inspection of our records what we've done for him and what we've done that he told us to do that we did not do so we're going to be held accountable there's going to be a day of reckoning if you will we went through all that in previous messages but we just need to be aware to number one make the most of every day N no I take that back make the most of every minute of every day make the most make the most with your children make, make the most with your spouse make the most of every day with your time with Jesus don't be flippant about any of these these areas don't be flippant and you know with your church attendance this these are the days these are the days that we need to get serious or more serious about the things of God. So make the most of every min minute. Determine that you're going to walk in love. You know, we've got to control our tongue as far as our verbiage and not saying things that are contrary to walking in love. We've got to use our gifts and talents for the Lord, which is what we're going to talk about. And we've got to fulfill every assignment that the Father has given us down to the very last detail. These are four things that are on your paper that I believe you need to focus on. If there's areas of weakness, you need to really uh, do a checkup from the neck up and make a plan. Because if you don't make a plan, you'll never get there. And so well, I, I believe we can do this. We also need to just make a determination, like even in your quiet time, 
put a, a notice on your on your phone put I'm not doing anything I'm just standing here real still I just want you to put a notice on your phone or um, on your mirror somewhere where you see it every day in your Bible and I want it to say live every day ready to meet Jesus by doing his will and then I really do want you to do a checkup from the neck up at night or the early the next morning at night would be better uh, but it could be early the next morning God did I do your perfect will every day you know take one day at a time and he's going to show you areas in your life that that you missed it because if you don't do these checks checkups just like that's why kids have tests in school to do a checkup to see where they are then you'll never progress in your walk with God and I believe I stand before people here in this room and those on watching that really want to do better like we want to do better we want to make every day count we want to do better tomorrow than we did today and you might think you're okay well you know you may think that but get alone with the father and make sure he wants you to do what you did yesterday or he wants to say because he'll quicken you he'll be quick you know I had to repent this morning about some things I said yesterday that weren't bad they weren't wrong you know totally but they didn't line up with they didn't please the father so I had to repent and that's another thing as I was praying about that you know we went through this kind of serious business about we're going to be held accountable for every idle word and we're going to be accountable for what we've done that wasn't what Jesus told us to do and was what Jesus told us to do you know and I was thinking about that you could kind of get into fear and intimidation about that but then one of the things that I thought that that makes sense I mean if you put the whole counsel of God together we're not going to be held accountable for things that we did that we got under the blood you know and you may have been thinking like I was you know 20 years ago not 20 maybe 40 how old am I I don't know um, <laughs> but 50 years ago I wasn't really living for the Lord do you understand and when I was teaching this, it was flashing through my mind <laughs> all the garbage that I did. A lot of it was unknowingly. A lot of Some of it was knowingly because I had been in church. But then as I, I prayed about it this morning, uh, what does the word say? What does the word say? Confess your sins one to another. And then it says, um, he is faithful and just. When we confess our sins, he will forgive us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness but then let's go to other scriptures that says he removes those sins as far as the east is from the west and he remembers them no more so you put all this together and you realize that that um that's not going to be on the screen <laughs> do you understand now if if we knowingly do those things that we know are unpleasing that are sin if he who knows to do and does it not to him it is sin if you don't that's why we have we have to be quick to repent do you understand we have to be quick to get it under the blood we have to get it be quick to say father forgive me because what does the word say say he remembers them no more well if it says he remembers them no more then why when we stand before the judgment seat is he going to pull up all this stuff that we've already been forgiven for that was very freeing to me i don't know if that's freeing to you but i thought <laughs> you know because I don't know, you know, kids are different, you know, everybody's different, but, you know, I've done some things that I wouldn't want on the computer screen. <laughs> Glory to God. So let's, let's move on. What will we give an account for? Let's look at these. Now, number one that I put on the list is that you and I will be judged on how you treated other believers in covenant community. Now, I'm just going to say how you, even though it's not specifically you rather than you and I, us, you know, how we treated everyone in covenant community. And that's important 
uh, this is how you're going to be judged in all these scriptures. And you might have read through the, the new covenant. You might have been re read through the Bible for a long time and never really noticed these things that I'm talking about. You know, like you will be uh, held accountable or there will be a reckoning or kind of all these scriptures are now fitting together and they're, the blinders are being removed from our eyes that yes, there's something that we're going to have to get with the program with from now on and not that we're regretful of what was done if it's under the blood. We, we just forget that and remove that as far as the east is the west and we remember it no more just like just like God does but as far as being motivated to do better now with the time we have left do you understand so you will be judged on how you treated other believers in covenant community and I know in deep we go over this about you are in covenant with me. You are in covenant with each other. We are in, as a local body, we are in a covenant community. We're in a covenant church where you're going to be held accountable for how you treat one another. Many of us don't think about that. We don't think that I have a covenant with, with every person in here. I have a covenant. Just look around. We have a covenant. We're in covenant community. That doesn't mean we can, we can just go and we can talk about anybody and everybody. That's why even, even different ones in the body who are preaching or prophesying or whatever, we just need to keep our mouth shut. You know, it's just very important. And the scripture that I want us to look at is 1 Peter 1.22. And it says, seeing you have purified your souls. Well, we know our souls, our mind, will, and emotion. Seeing you have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the spirit unto unfeigned love. Now, we know this is King James, you know, my favorite part. Um, but it says unfeigned, that means not fake. So we can read it, seeing you have purified your souls. I think we can understand that because we've talked about, you know, cleaning up our mind. You can't think trash and it think garbage and expect to live right because what you think you you speak and you do so the the first part is thinking correctly seeing you have purified your souls and obeying the truth through the spirit unto unfeigned or unto not fake love of the brethren see we can't be fake and remember what pastor Pastor Rodney said this year is removing the, the fake from the real. This is time to be real. We can't, oh, I love you, and then talk about you behind, my, behind Deborah's back. You see, you can't do that. This is uh, not fake love of the brethren. That's those of us in covenant community. And then it goes on to say, see that you love one another with a pure heart, fervently. That means if you have ought against anybody, and it goes back really to scripture and other places that are coming to my remembrance. Like the Bible says, even before you take communion, if you have, if you have ought against anybody in your church body, like you're sitting here and you know, Deborah's mad at Darla. Okay, you better not take communion. Like, that's not good. Because the word says, don't do that. If you have ought, or say Deborah knows that Darla has ought against her, but De Darla doesn't say anything, then Deborah needs to get up and go and say, I understand by the spirit that you have ought against me, and I want to get it out before I take the elements. We have to understand the seriousness of this situation. So either way, we want to walk in love. We want to walk in love one with another. And that means, really, it says with a pure heart fervently. Now, what does a pure heart fervently mean? Red hot love one for another. Red hot love. That means I'm going to love you regardless. I'm going to love you regardless. Uh, and, and, you know, really, even in the body, Deborah may go to Darla and say, Darla, forgive me. 
you know, you have ought against me. Uh, would you please forgive me for whatever? And, and Deborah's pure toward that, you know. And m- maybe Darla will say, well, I, I'm not ready to forgive you yet. I'm not going to forgive you. Then, then that's Darla's issue. Do you understand? Like, Deborah is free from that because she's done all she could do according to the word. Now, what I want us to do is I want us to go to 1 Corinthians 13, which is the love chapter in the Amplified, because I just want to read those verses that you should probably memorize because they are so good. And I just want to take a little bit of time just because we we sometimes... Uh, we're not diligent to look in various translations. But 4 through 8 in the Amplified says this. Love endures with patience and serenity. Love is kind and thoughtful and is not jealous or envious. Love does not brag and is not proud or arrogant. It is not rude. It is not self-seeking. It is not provoked nor overly sensitive and easily angered. It does not take into account a wrong endured. It does not rejoice at injustice, but rejoices when the truth prevails. Love bears up under all things regardless of what comes, believes all things, looking for the best in each person. Love hopes all things, remaining steadfast during difficult to- difficult times endures our th- all things without weakening love never fails so that's 4 through 8 in the amplified now you can put your name in there Kathy never fails you know in place of love because you are love you walk in love now it's important to know that I'm going to read it in the message which kind of gives you a little bit different verbiage that whatever you want to memorize, but you might do this. Love never gives up. Like you don't give up on anybody. Aren't you glad that God didn't give up on you? God didn't say, "Mm, you know, mm." Sonny's, you know, he's a lost cause. God didn't do that. Love cares more for others than for self. Now look up that and underline that. Think about that because we're a self-absorbed generation according to the word. But when you start caring for others than you, you do yourself, that's the true epitome of love. Love doesn't want what it doesn't have. That's being envious and covetous. Oh, I wish I looked like them. I wish I had a figure like them. Or I wish I had a job like them. Or, or whatever it is. Love doesn't want what it doesn't have love doesn't strut doesn't have a swelled head that means not prideful love doesn't force itself on others isn't always me first what about me what about me what about me doesn't fly off the handle doesn't keep score of the sins of others people do that Well, you did, especially husbands and wives. Well, you did that yesterday. Okay, are we keeping score here? Are we going to forgive and forget? Love um, doesn't fly off the handle, doesn't keep score of others, doesn't revel when others grovel, takes pleasure in the flowering of truth, puts up with anything, trusts God always, always looks for the best, never looks back but keeps going to the end whichever um translation that really kind of gets to you listen to it over and over again or or write it out you know the one scripture that that i quote every day and this is how i keep my heart pure i do not let anything get in my heart because I know the seriousness of it. I always, always say, takes no account of a suffered wrong. As soon as there's something that is done or said that, you know, you feel that emotion or you you just, you know, you just uh, wanna deck them, 
then what you do is you you say, remember, this is how you counter a thought with words. I say, I take no account of a suffered wrong. I refuse to let that even get into my consciousness. Because if you let it get in your consciousness, then what does your subconscious deal with when you're asleep at night? It deals with that thought. Well, let's move on. I think that's enough about loving the brethren. It gives you a kind of idea. There is one more scripture, and it's found in Matthew 10, 41 through 42. And it's saying, uh, Jesus is talking, and he says, He that receives you receives me, and he that receives me receives him. So you have to see one another in the brethren, especially believers, as this is Jesus. Now, would you treat Jesus that way? Would you treat Jesus the way you're treating Keely? You know, ignoring her or being rude to her, you know, you have to think about these things. You have to put the two to, two together because the Spirit of God resides on the inside of Keeley. And then it goes on to say, He that receives a prophet in the name of a prophet shall receive a prophet's reward. He that receives, listen to this, a righteous man shall receive a righteous man's reward. So that, that kind of puts a little bit different slant on it, doesn't it? So let's go to that real quickly. In the Amplified, uh, I'm getting almost as fast in the Amplified as I am with the phone as I am with a real Bible drill. We need to have more of those in Kids Church, Pastor Faith, so they can find the scriptures. But Matthew 10, 41 through 42 in the Amplified says this, he who receives and welcomes a prophet because he is a prophet will receive a prophet's reward. And he who receives a righteous, honorable man because he is a righteous man will receive a righteous man's reward. And whoever gives to one of these little ones, these, those, these who are humble in rank or influence, doesn't mean children like it says in the King James all the time, even a cup of water to drink because he is my disciple, truly he will, will um, not lose his reward. So this, is, this is encompasses not only, you know, the love, but what you do with that love. Do you understand the action that you have? So let's move to number two. You will be judged on how you use the talents and abilities that you were given by God. Now this is so very important, and I would encourage you to go back and read Matthew 25 in as many translations as you can. The part about the talents, because talents can be money, it can be your abilities. You know, some of you have hidden abilities, and by hidden I mean it's hidden from you. God has created us each one fearfully and wonderfully. Well, he didn't give one of you gifts and talents and say, mm, you know, I'm not giving her any. He didn't do that. Do you understand? We all have gifts and talents. Now, sometimes we have to guard our heart against wanting somebody else's gifts and talents. But that's covetousness. So we need to take care of that in our prayer closet. But we also need to take care of the fact that God may have called you and you know, I'm called to be a wife. I'm called to be a mother. But there may be other things that God has called you to do. He has put on you, inside of you, gifts and talents. Well, I'm called to be a businessman. Well, there may be other things on the inside. I'm called to be a student. Yes, but you know, I appreciate the fact that last time in Kingdom Business Fellowship, we had four teenagers. Yes, they're called to go to school. Yes, they're called to do good on their paces. Yes, they're called to be a good student and to keep their mouth shut and to do the, their work and to not live carnal, all those things. But God has placed in their heart gifts and talents and abilities. And sometimes we compartmentalize and say, no, this is my season to be a mom. Well, read Proverbs 31. Proverbs 31 woman was a virtuous woman. She just, she just didn't do one thing at a time. 
like she had businesses, she bought land, she did, she was able to do uh, different things because God had graced her with gifts and talents. And that's what we need to seek God and find out what is your gift, what is your talent, what is your motivation. Uh, and it's, it's got to be God's talent and gift on the inside of you. Well, I just don't have time. No, you get alone with God and God will make a way where there seems to be no way for you to make that lipstick or for you to make that t-shirt or for you to make that jewelry or for you to make those, the wood carving things. You know, that cornhole game that everybody loves, Kim and Billy Fink are backlogged with orders from all over the world because they both have full-time jobs but yet God has graced them with the ability to do that and then to paint on there whatever they need God will make a way where there seems to be no way you have a gift and a talent doesn't matter how old you are do you understand you have gifts and talents that you could be using for the Lord but you've got to get alone with God, seek out and find what those gifts and talents are and use those talents for the Lord. Just like the ta parable of the talents in Matthew 25, you do not want to bury your talents. God wasn't pleased with those who didn't use their talents. He's given it to you to use to use not to bury it's up to you to find out what it is and when you read that you recognize that God gives you talents according to your King James several ability <laughs> so you understand that you don't covet somebody else's talent you just covet uh, you just do what God gave you with your talent do you understand so you spend time with the Father. You don't let your talent be dormant. Because what does the end of that, that parable say? Take this wicked and lazy servant. See, we all have the same amount of time in a day. And we all have the same amount of energy as Pastor Charity has talked about in Jumpstart. And some people are just flat lazy lazy sitting around doing nothing we don't want to be lazy so the lord in the parable was not pleased with the one who didn't do anything but he was pleased with the ones who did something with it if you don't use it you can lose it especially in church there are people i know when we first got started at the other building that we needed a piano player and I knew people who could play the piano. And without saying, you know, you could really use your talent for the Lord. They never came forth. They never came forth with their talent, whether it was because of intimidation, whatever. But when you take that first step, God will make you able. Do you understand that? The par this parable in in uh, Matthew 25 confirms the the same parable, similar parable in Luke 16:12, and you can read that because if you're not faithful over the things that you have that belong to another man, for instance, if you're not faithful in what you're doing wherever you are, then God's not going to give you more. And so faithfulness, listen, <laughs> faithfulness is the key. Faithfulness is the key. Always be faithful. And really, uh, 2 Timothy 1.6, and Pastor Charity referred to this sometime. Um, I think maybe it was in deep. But 2 Timothy 1.6, Paul is telling young Timothy because he was young. Just because you're young doesn't mean you can't do anything. Right. Do you understand? Right. You can do things when you're young. Yeah. And and. Timothy was young and Paul was older and he, he pastored this church at Ephesus and he says, you know, you may need to just stir up the gifts, the gifts that are in you. So I believe that's a good word picture of you got to stir them up instead of I can't, I can't, I can't. 
I can. You may have dreams and you may be 60, 70, 50 years old, or you may be 10, that God has put some things in your heart that you believe you can do, but you just thought, I can't do this because I'm too young, or I can't do this because I'm too old. Stir them up, stir them up. Stir up, up the gifts and talents that are in you. See, we can't be lazy. We have to be faithful over what God has given us. And this includes talents with your children, talents with your spouse, talents with your grandchildren. You know, there are mothers in here. There are dads who, who have a great ability to get a younger men under their wing or younger women and show them how to raise their kids. Well, I didn't raise them perfect, but you did do some things right. Like you were on a schedule every day. Some of these young mothers, they're chaotic. They don't know how to get on a schedule. They don't know how to clean one room at a time. They don't know these, these common things that maybe your mother taught you or your dad taught you. And you're not, you're not teaching anybody. You know, when we, we worked on this building, we had some older men that were part of our, our um, Tuesday and Thursday night team. And they came and they knew how to do things. They knew how to do things. And I would go up to them, how, how did you learn how to do things? Well, my dad taught me how, how to do electrical. You know, are you an electrician? No, but God taught me how to do that. God taught me how to, uh, my dad taught me how to do certain things. See, that's what we need to do. We need to, to, older people need to teach the younger people. That's what the word says when it talks about that. And so I went to them and I said, look, we got some young men in here who are eager to learn. Now we got some who are lazy and they don't want to do anything. So they're not going to pick up on this. But I said, there's some young men who you can teach them how to do something because maybe they didn't have a dad to teach them how to do things. And, and then I went to the younger men and I said, listen, you follow this one around. You learn some things from him because he knows how to put a level on a piece of wood and see if it's straight and not put it on crooked. And then of course, you know, we have our friend Google who, who tells you how to do some things, but you have to be wise to do that. Thank God for Google if you don't have an older man in your life. But I'm telling you, there needs to be older men and women who step up to the plate. You pray and ask God, like, what are some things I can do to help some of the younger generation? You know, the, the kitchens and the bathrooms that have the, the, the rubber cove base around, these are wood base right in here. Pastor Faith, right? But in the kitchen areas and in the bathroom areas, they have to have that rubber stuff. Do you understand? Well, we couldn't get anybody to do it. We couldn't get a contractor to do it. So Pastor Faith got on Google and she did the whole building that has that kind of cove base. She figured it out. You see, you ask the Holy Spirit, how do I do this? He said, go to Google. This is what you get. These are the materials that you do. And you do it. See, it's just laziness. I don't know how to do that. I don't know. I don't know how to sew. I remember when my dad bought me a sewing machine and said, make your own clothes, which was really a blessing. Because I wanted store-bought clothes, and he bought me a sewing machine. <laughs> make them yourself. But I remember, I don't know if those of you who sew, but a zipper is hard to put in. Like, how in the world? I, I don't know how many zippers I did and that they were crooked. And then finally, <laughs> finally I got this bright idea, which that was way before Google Girls. And so I thought, well, I'm just gonna read the instructions. And you know what? After I read the instructions, I could put in a zipper. The first dress that I decided to make was not just a simple dress. It had a panel here, it had a panel here, it had a panel here, two in the back and one in the middle. 
Now think about that when you put that down on the paper with that paper stuff and you try to cut it out and you want to match the plaids. You know, that's why I buy a top and it doesn't match plaids. I'm not going to buy that top. It doesn't match. Like, I spent a lot of time matching those things <laughs> when I was sewing. And I didn't even know how to sew. But my Aunt Bess, my Aunt Minnie Pearl, my Aunt, you know, May told me, you got to match the plaids. You got to match. They have to match if it's green here it has to match up with green here you know people just throw things together and we go to stores and pay I was at Kate Spade looking at a dress and it did not match I like that dress I didn't get it <laughs> the plaids didn't match the scene didn't match you know who do they think they are they can sell that dress for that much money and it doesn't even match that's ridiculous so let's move on. So I said you will be judged on how you use the talents and abilities that you were given by God. And I don't really believe in my heart that that was a gift or talent given to me by God. I made the best of a not good situation because I wanted, I wanted clothes that didn't look like my Aunt Minnie Pearl made them if you can understand what I mean. But the key is faithfulness. I mean, I was faithful over that sewing machine. In fact, after I got married, we carted that sewing machine all over. Every house that we lived in, every, every time we redid a room, we would, Pastor Dean was so upset with that because he thought it was ugly. You know, where are you going to put that sewing machine? It was a big cabinet one, so you couldn't just hide it in a closet. But I was faithful over that. Now I can be ruler over buying things that are already made. Praise God. But that's the crowbar. Be faithful. Faithful over little you have. Faithful over what you have. And the word of God tells us how to be faithful in every area. It's a win-win situation. So you need to be honest and answer the question. Am I faithful? God, if I'm not faithful in a certain area, are you faithful in your Bible reading? Or do you get up every morning and, you know, sometimes I read it and sometimes I'm not, I don't, you know, it's not really that important to me. I'm telling you, this isn't the time to have that kind of attitude. I don't care how old you are. This is serious business. Are you faithful to the local church? Are you, can people count on you? Can people count on you to do what you volunteer to do for do and be on time and be on time I won't go there because I'm not getting angry today and I don't want to take account of a suffered wrong when I, I just don't want to do that you will be judged on how you use your time and energy this, this is a good indicator of of what you feel like is important. And I commend every one of you for using your time to come to Coffee with PK. Thank you for doing that. Because you know, every one of you could have stayed home today with the exception of the kids going to school, but every one of you could have stayed home and, and, and said, well, I can do my ironing while I watch Pastor Kathy. You could have done that. But I commend you on using your time. Those of you who are tuning in, I commend you on using your time, whether it's real time or later. I commend you for using your time. There are so many distractions. When you could be uh, not even doing your housework, you could be watching soap operas or you could be watching things on TV, sitting at home in your bathrobe. But you got up, you got dressed and went to work. You, you're doing something uh, to, to focus. Maybe this is your lunch hour. Maybe you didn't eat lunch today so you could listen to these, these, this message. You know, you could be home playing video games or on fake book. You know, I'm telling you that, that um, when you get your priorities right, when you get your time right, your day is going to go better. Yes. When you're staying home the same amount of hours, like for instance, tonight is or nights. You could say, oh, you know, I have a favorite TV show on, on Tuesday night. You should not have a favorite TV show. <laughs> There's no favorites on the TV. 
But, you know, those three hours, you come to church. Let me tell you, let me tell you what happened, I believe, this last week. You know, we give you good reports every time of, of adults and kids and teens coming to or nights. And it's catchy. I mean, yeah. it's catchy. Like, you want to come. This little boy, and he announced, I believe, last Sunday how he, um, he went out witnessing and how he prayed with people. Well, he came into his mom, and how old is Eric? Maybe eight? Eight. So he, he, what he did was he went up to his mother, and he said the person that his, his stepdad is not his real dad. Do you understand? He's a stepdad. So he comes up to his mother and he says, Mom, because he had practice. See, the mom brought him to Ornites. Now he likes to go to Ornites and tell people about Jesus. See, it's catchy. The mom is a good example. She didn't drop him off. She came with him. So he said, I want to call dad, meaning his real dad, and I want to pray with him to receive Jesus. And you know what he did? He called his dad and prayed with his real dad to receive Jesus as his Lord. That little kid is using his gift and talent because he does have a gift of verbiage. You know, he likes to talk. You saw him on the stage. Give me the mic back. (laughs) I have something else to say about that. But see, everybody has time if you use it for the Lord. And it will be worth it on Judgment Day. It will be worth it. Uh, If you looked at your life and you measured it with what you love the most, would, would time in the Word, time with your family, time at church be a number one priority? Or would be your time with with Jesus way down on the list and you give him your leftovers. That's why I feel like it's important to to pray, intercede, spend your quiet time in the morning because I don't know about y'all, but at night you're done. Yeah. You know, like it's it's really a good opportunity for the enemy to come in and you're shun dying and the next minute you're snoring. <laughs> you know, that kind of thing. So it's important that you know you. Yeah. And you know when you're your your freshest. And most people, maybe you're different if you're a night person, but most people are fresher in the morning. Ephesians 5.16, we've read this before. Redeeming the time because the days are evil. So this is a command. Everything that God says, this isn't optional. This is a command. Colossians 4, 5, walk in wisdom toward them that are without, redeeming the time. In other words, be about the Father's business. Be about the Father's business. There's no better place that you could be on a Tuesday or a Thursday. And I'm not saying you have to come every Tuesday, every Thursday, but at least come and begin to use your talents for the Lord so you can, well, I I really can't talk. Will you come and find out how to do that? And then it becomes practice that gives progress, you understand? And then pretty soon you will be witnessing at a restaurant. You will be leaving those little cards, not only leaving a card, but saying, can I pray for you today? You understand, this is, this is what we're to be about. Number four, you will be judged on how you disciplined your fleshly appetites say amen or oh me but think about that first corinthians 9 24 through 27 says know ye not that they which run in a race run all but one receives the prize so run the race that you can obtain and every man that striveth for the mastery this is of course king james is temperate in all things Now they do it to obtain a corruptible crown, but we an incorruptible. I therefore so run, not as uncertain, so fight I not as one that beateth the air, but I keep my body under. You keep your body under. You cannot let your flesh control you, whether it's in your eating, whether it's in your eating sweets, whether it's in your, in your uh, just things that you desire in your body, that your cravings, you know, there's all kinds of things on the 
Google that, you know, if you're craving carbs, then put your finger on certain part of your nose or your whatever. You know, I try to do it all like, okay, I don't want to eat that piece of bread. <laughs> you know, whatever. Um, just, just so I can control my flesh. I'm going to do whatever it takes because my flesh loves bread and butter. Not so much toast and jam, but bread and butter. If you eat, that was before all of your time, probably maybe not all of you, that song. But nonetheless, you got to control your flesh. You got to, do you think we like to exercise? Do you think Pastor Dean and I like getting on the shaker and now my girls are getting me another piece of equipment that they think I need to do? You know, because I need more exercise. Yes. You know the problem with older people, whether you're listening to me on YouTube or you're you're in here and younger people even also, is they can't get up off the floor. That's why people are in old folks' homes. I don't know what you call them now, but anyway, they're in homes because they can't sit on the toilet themselves. They can't get out of bed and go to the toilet. That's why they're wearing diapers. Do you understand? Because their legs don't work. So you should be walking. Yes. Find a partner and walk. Take control of your body. You're going to be held accountable for what you did with your body because if you're not, if you're out of control in your body, you're not going to live as long. And I know all of us should Jesus tarry. And I, I pray to God, he's not going to tarry another 50 years for me. Let's see, that's 30, yeah, 40, 50, 50 years. So I'll be 120. But nonetheless, you know, I want to be able to, to um, do like Moses. Yeah. You know, his, his natural forces were not abated. That's, right. that's what it says. And if you start feeling, mm, it's hard to get out of this rocker chair, then quit rocking. <laughs> get up and move. Yeah, yeah. You know, if you're spreading, spreading, spreading at the backside, then begin to do some things. Same with you younger people. You don't get energy. You don't get um, exercise anymore. We used to have to run at school. We, had, we used to have to play. We used to have to get some exercise. We used to have to sweat move on uh, from, from this I understand that that's probably what you're um, get some sleep you know there's no reason to stay up half the night for fake book or whatever well I want to connect with my family no you want no you don't number five you will be judged on how many you witness to about Jesus now not how many that got saved because that's not your responsibility. Do you understand? God's not going to hold you accountable for somebody who says no. But he's going to hold you accountable for you to say so. To say something. Daniel 12, 3. And they that be wise shall shine as the brightness of the firmament. And they that turn many to righteousness as the stars forever and ever. You will be judged on how many you told about Jesus. Well, open your mouth. This is our command by God, the head of the church, to go into our world. Matthew 28, 19 through 20. You can't ignore the commission to go and tell. Tell the good news. You can't ignore Mark 16, 15 through 18. You can't ignore that. You go lay hands on the sick. Do you notice it says believers do that? It doesn't say pastors only can do this it says you do this don't relegate that to the leadership of the church or the pastors you will be judged number six on your faithfulness to the power of the gospel this is good this is good second timothy 4 1 through 2 i charge thee again paul is talking to young timothy who she before, let me read it again. I charge thee, therefore, before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing in his kingdom. Preach the word. That's for everybody. Preach the word. Be instant in season. Well, it's inconvenient. Okay. Be instant in season, out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine 
See, you go back to Mark 16, 15 through 18, and it says believers lay hands on the sick and they will recover. Uh, it says in the word of God that we're supposed to go. Jesus told his disciples, he said, you go heal the sick, raise the dead. You go. Aren't we those people th that are supposed to go? Because you have the power on the inside of you. Isn't that what the Bible says? The same power that raised Christ from the dead dwells in you. I got the power in that song, Charity. We have the power. We have the power. Yeah. In the name of Jesus. And read motivational books like, like uh, The Power of the Blood <laughs> or The Name of Jesus. You know, you take your two-edged sword, which is your mouth, and you go and you tell people about Jesus. You're fully equipped. Listen, if you've been saved one hour, you're fully equipped to do this. So you go into, into your world. You be a good steward is what I'm trying to say. God has given you power. It's kind of like the talents. Not for you to bury it. Not for you to do like that little song we used to do in kids' church. This little light of mine, I'm going to hide it under a bushel. No, I'm going to let it shine. Don't let Satan it out. I know that's elementary, but it's a good word picture. Some of you have let Satan yeah. blow it out. Yeah. Well, I'm too old to do anything. Well, if you get up and just, hey, what, how about walking around your block yeah. and praying for all the people in your block? Yeah, <laughs> you know, yeah. do... Do some prayer walking. You can do that. Like uh, instead of in your wheelchair yeah. or instead of in your rocker, yeah. your, your muscles getting stiff yeah. because you haven't moved all day because you've been sitting there with the yeah. clicker. Well, I'm watching. I'm watching gospel messages. I'm watching Voice of Victory all day. Yeah, but you can't get your butt up out of the chair. You need to do a little exercise. You need a little fresh air. So, you know, this all works together. What are you doing with your body besides sitting around taking medicine? <sighs> Gone to Medlin. Okay, so number seven, you will be judged on how you use your money. Mm. Mind your own business, Pastor Kathy. Matthew 6, 1 through 4 says, Take heed that you do not put your alms before men to be seen of them. Otherwise, you have no reward of your Father which is in heaven. Therefore, when you do thine alms, do not stand, sound a trumpet before thee as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets that they may have glory of men. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. That was like the Pharisees and the Sadducees. They wanted everybody to see how much money they put in the container. And they just dropped it, made a big noise. They just were so uh, prideful and so, like, no, no. Nobody needs to know, but if God looked at your checkbook or your debit card or your bank statement or whatever people use nowadays, would he see that, oh, is, is giving to the local church, giving to all the funds we have around here a priority? Or does it say Netflix and the Disney yeah. Channel? And, you know, I do people's uh, kind of help them sometimes with their, their a green sheet. And I'm going, what else are you paying for? <laughs> like, they're, they're paying like 50 and $100 for all these extras that I don't even know the names of them that you can get so that they can sit there on their lazy butt and watch movies all day yeah. or whenever they want them. Well, it relaxes me. You know what will really relax you? Reading the Word of God. That will really relax you. But no, we've got it in our mindset that... I need to I need to relax and this is the way I relax by watching these TV programs which do not minister life in any way shape form or fashion going on with these verses verse 3 but when you do your alms let not thy left hand know what thy right hand doeth in other words you don't sound an alarm oh you know I gave I gave 100,000 to the building fund you know I gave to that keep your mouth shut and keep your money um, 
that thine alms may be in secret. So thy, listen to this verse 4. And thy father which sees in secret himself shall reward thee openly. See, what's so exciting to me is to give to somebody when they don't know it. When it's kind of in secret. Like, would you give this to them? Don't tell them who gave it to you. You know, we've had that happen in restaurants where we're sitting there and, and people, the waitress comes over and she says, you know, we've, your ticket's been taken care of. And it's such a blessing. We sit there and go, who did that? I don't see anybody in here that I even know. Like, who would have done that? Or, you know, be like Jonathan. We went to one Mexican food restaurant with Jonathan, and he went up to the register. I'm wondering, what is he doing? Um, he paid for the whole restaurant. Now he didn't make a show. I got your ticket, everybody. You don't have to pay for anything. No, he just said, get, and the, the lady at the register is going, say again, uh, no comprende? <laughs> I want everybody's ticket in here. <laughs> and he paid for everybody's. Not not a big show. Praise the Lord. But is your giving reflected in your checkbook? Are you expanding the kingdom in that way? Well, I live on a fixed income. You know, I just want to throw up when people tell me that. You You live on a fixed income and it will remain fixed the rest of your day. You start giving... And your fixed income is going to be multiplied. <laughs> it will be multiplied. But it's what you value. I used to do this, this little illustration in kids' church. And I would get up and have a banana that I was eating. And saying, this is representing my money. So I took a bite. I went to Walmart. And then I went to the Nochinos. And then took another bite. And then I, you know, and then I was down to the very little bit. You know, that little bitty thing at the bottom, you know. And then I threw that. That was what I brought to church. That's what I gave to God. He got the leftovers. Is that what we give to God? The leftovers. It should be what's exactly on top. Well, we got through seven. We didn't get through the rest of them. I apologize. Uh, but we will finish next time. Father.